Um, my name is Nico Lang. Um, I'm a longtime LGBTQ plus journalist who's been reporting on the community's fight for equality for over like 10 years, depending on how you round. Um, I started out doing like more like entertainment reporting and op-ed writing, but then in 2015, 2016, when Trump declared his intention to run for president and then did, and then was doing a lot better than we all thought he would, um, it just seemed like there was a real tide turning. And you saw that in the anti-trans legislation around the country that was bubbling up. Like some of the earliest examples were the bathroom fights um, in Houston um, and then in North Carolina, which passed HB2 in 2016. If folks aren't familiar, it was the first, the nation's first ever anti-trans bathroom law um, that banned trans folks from using bathrooms that align with their identities in all public spaces. It led to this huge economic backlash against North Carolina. They lost like over a billion dollars um, to their economy as the result of that. And I think a lot of folks thought that would just be a blip, that it's like, well, North Carolina, you know, they learned the lesson. Um, they, you know, with that, I'm really bad at idioms. So it's like they fought the bull, they got the horns. Is that the one? Um, they did that. Um, and because they made that mistake, nobody else is going to. And I had this sense at the time that that wasn't true, that we were seeing a tide turn um, because there was just so much like anti-trans rhetoric um, and just like broader like anti-LGBTQ plus sentiment that was bubbling up all across the country. Mississippi the same year um, passed HB 1523, which is still arguably the nation's worst anti-LGBTQ plus law. It allows um, just private businesses to turn away folks um, because of their gender, uh, their gender identity or sexual orientation. So basically, if I have a restaurant, I can just deny you service because of who you are. And that's still on the books. There's been a court case for many years fighting it, um, but it still hasn't been overturned yet. And I just knew then that I needed to do more work storytelling to tell the stories of people who are going to be impacted by these like bad bills and bad laws, because if it was happening everywhere, um, it was going to be like affecting a lot of people. And I noticed in the coverage there just wasn't a lot of actually talking to people about how this impacts their lives. Like you'd have like the New York Times would go down to North Carolina to talk about HB2 and happen to not meet a single trans person while they were there. And it's like, if you wanna know the real like, the real harm of this kind of legislation, you need to talk to trans people, you need to hear from them. And that also led to this kind of work in terms of working with trans youth. Because American teenager, which I spent a year traveling the country to write, and then another year, you know, um, edit, writing and editing, is all about hearing from folks who are impacted by like anti-trans bills and bad anti-trans policy. Uh, this year, I believe we're now up to 658 bills have been introduced in states across the country um, targeting trans youth. Um, and it's not, people often look to like one or two states, they'll see what's happening in Oklahoma and see what's happening in Missouri and be like, you know, that's their problem, right? It's not happening here. But there's only a small handful of states that haven't had a single anti-trans bill. It's happening everywhere, even in blue states. Or you have somewhere like Nashua County in um, on Long Island in New York, rather than the state passing an anti-trans sports ban, they took it on themselves as a county to ban trans people from sports. You see it happening at the local level, you see it happening at the school level, and it's just everywhere. And with so much opposition to the very existence of trans kids, I wanted to give them the chance to speak back to that because they haven't really gotten the opportunity. Because like, let's say you read, not to pick on journalists too much, but to pick on them a little bit. Like, let's say that you read a story about a policy impacting trans kids and I'll pick a random state in Montana. They're not in le the legislative session this year, but we'll pick on them anyway. Um, most of the time, if you read that story, you're not going to be hearing from an, a single trans kid. You will likely hear from an advocacy group, or if you're lucky, you'll hear from the parent of a trans kid. And I think it's really important to hear the parent perspective, right? Um, but if we're only getting the parent perspective over and over again, you're not getting to know these kids. You're not getting the chance to see them as human, as like a fully realized person the same way that you are. You don't get to empathize with them. And I know why that's happened, because so many parents are worried about their kids being out there too much um, and the sort of like harm and danger that can come from that. But it means though, that for folks who have that kind of privilege um, and are able to do that, that work becomes even more important. And it becomes more important for me as a storyteller to tell those stories. So that's what I did. I traveled the country for a year. I spent time with uh, trans kids and their families in seven different states. We'll see if I can do this in order, but I'm really bad at it. Um, South Dakota, Alabama, West Virginia, Texas, Illinois, Florida, and then California.
And the stories were super diverse. The families were really diverse, you know, in terms of like not just their geography, but their like class status, um, their racial backgrounds, their religious backgrounds. Um, we had uh, an Episcopalian family in Texas. Um, our family in um, in Illinois is Pakistani Muslim. And my goal there was to show how many kinds of families are impacted by this, right? That there's not just one kind of family who has a trans kid. There are lots of families, and many of those families are families of faith. The family in Texas is deeply affirming of their daughter and has been ever since she came out. Like, because they're Episcopalian, there exists in their faith tradition what's known as a renaming liturgy that's essentially just like a big coming out party for like, you know, for a trans person when they sort of come out and declare themselves, you know, as being themselves, they then um, are able to update their confirmation certificate, right, and get a new one. And they hold this like big ceremony and this big party in the church. And for the family, it was a really important sign that their faith was going to love their daughter and their community was going to love to their daughter because that's not always a given. And with that, you know, I wanted to tell a different story about religion, but I wanted to tell just different stories about these kids and their lives and also give them the chance to tell different stories about their lives. Because so often they're just not re-centered in their, their narratives on who they are. Um, and they just don't get a lot of agency. And this book all is all about agency. You know, I'm giving, I'm spending two and a half weeks at a time with these kids to tell their stories, but really I'm giving them a chance to tell it themselves. Like I wasn't deciding what their story was for them. I was asking them, you know, what's important to you to express? What do you want people to know about who you are and the life that you lead? And I just think that through that, like, as I said before, you can come to see these kids not as like pe being like public enemy number one or these like sea monsters who were lurking at the bottom of the sea before a few years ago, right? But you just see them as kids. They're just kids trying to live their daily lives. And right now lawmakers are making that increasingly difficult. And with this book, you know, I wanted, you know, the average public to be able to get to know these kids um, and to learn from their stories and just learn from their perspectives. But for those lawmakers who are doing that, I wanna make it really clear what they're doing. They're hurting people, they're hurting kids. And like, it's my job as a journalist to make that work of hurting them a little bit harder. So, you know, that's what I'm going to do. And that's pretty much the end of my spiel. I told Emily before this, I'm not great. At, I just had to give a keynote speech this weekend. And I learned the hard way. I'm not great at talking for like a half hour straight. I get a little bit tired, um, but I'm really good at Q and A's like, and I love answering questions. So if anybody has any questions about this book, my background, you know, what I hope to express by telling these stories, please, like, I would love, like, just as full and robust of a discussion as possible, because this book is all about furthering discussions. Thank you, Nico. That's, that was a great intro. And I just wrote a note to remind people to please um, write their questions in the chat. But as I give people a moment to, to do that, um, I'll just kind of, I would love if you would share a little bit more about how did you get into journalism? What draws you um, to this? If you could give us a few touching points with kind of what keeps you in this work and inspires you. God, I stay in this work because I'm not good at anything else. I have like one, like I'm good at like one thing and that's this. Um, but, you know, I sort of got into this work accidentally because it was never presented to me really as like an option to do this kind of work. Like, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, the kind of work I do didn't really exist, right? That you had publications like The Advocate doing it and Out Magazine doing it, but it was like quite niche. So it was never like, I never really saw it being as an option for me. It was like never presented as being a thing really. And so when I started out, I was actually really inspired by Roger Ebert. Like I grew up reading film reviews and his reviews just because I loved his perspective on the world. Um, and the way he saw film. Um, so for me, like, I think I realized, I think what I thought at the time was, oh, I want to write about movies, right? That because, you know, he loves movies so much, so obviously I want to do that too. And then I was a film reviewer for a couple of years, and it just didn't make me happy. And it just wasn't like, to be honest, I wasn't that great at it. I was like, okay. But like, there were all of these film like journalists who were just really crushing it. And I would read their reviews, and they were just so engaged. And it's like, I don't know, I just wanted to say a funny couple funny quippy things and like move about my day. But I think what I was really engaged with was what I think Ebert was really tapping into, which, which was human experience, right? And I got the opportunity to do a little bit of journalism for NPR when I was in college. And that sort of just led from one thing to another. And, you know, in those new opportunities that I, that I was taking, because I would just sort of, you know, pivot from one thing to the next thing, like it was always like burrowing deeper, 
and deeper into people's lived experiences. At first, it was sort of about my own experience, like in the way I saw the world, but I just became more interested in how other people see the world and giving them that platform, right? Because it's like I had the opportunity to express my opinion on the world and the way it is, but I just became so curious about giving other people that opportunity to hear about like their opinion about the world and you know what it is. And for trans people, they just don't really get that opportunity. In this book, it's really interesting because you know, I wanted to give kids the opportunity to speak about their transness, right? About their lives, about what it means to be a trans person. But so much of the book is just about what it means to be a person. My favorite, um, ooh, sorry, it's early here, so I'm like stretching. Um, one of my favorite passages in the whole book is in Florida with the trans girl there. We stood on the balcony of her apartment for like two hours talking about Kierkegaard one day. And just like our like different like interpretations of um, I always want to call it fear and loathing, fear and trembling, because um, she had like one way of viewing it. And I was like, well, that's not what I see at all. And we just talked about it for like an hour as she like smoked a cigarette. And I, when we were in the middle of that, I, I knew that it had to go in the book because it's the kind of thing that like, you know, we're like thinking people on this earth. We have conversations about the world. Right. And about so many different things that don't have to do with like. You know, if you're a trans person being trans or a queer person being trans, being queer, but you kind of only get to be queer in the media. You don't get to be anything else. So for this girl, like I just wanted her to give like to give her space to talk about Kierkegaard. Right. Because I'd never heard it before. I'd never heard something like that before. And it felt just so like quietly radical. Right. Um, but it also just connects to like that experience I was talking about of like the experience of being alive and what it means to be a person. And that's just so much of what this book is about for me. Like, it's not just about these trans kids being trans. It's about them being people and being human and living in the world the same way the rest of us do. And I feel like sometimes people don't get that. They look at trans people and they're like, oh, you're so different. So you must have like such a different life from, from me. And they do in some ways, right? We're all just like different from each other, aren't, aren't we? Like, I'm different from Emily, right? I would never insist that we're the same person. But I just think that we shouldn't be afraid of that difference. And we should also like look for the similarities too. And I think that that's very much what my journalism about and that's what this book is about too awesome we've had some great um questions being asked in the chat and i want to give people the opportunity to come off of mute and ask it yourself but also i'm happy um to do that but um gene i wonder if um you would be willing to come off mute and ask your question and engage with nico um sure i think i have to remember what the question was here <laughs> <laughs> i just was wondering um was there how old the kids that you talked to were um, in general? And then if you got a sense of um, when they knew they were trans and then when they got to start transitioning. Sure. Um, so the kids were about 15 to 19. Um, that was purposeful because I had talked to younger kids for this book um, and they just weren't ready to talk about their stories in a really meaningful way. Like, it's not that they don't know who they are or that they like aren't trans or something. It's just that like, you know, you all have met kids. Like I would sit down with these like five-year-olds and eight-year-olds and be like, let's talk about being trans. And they'd be like, they couldn't really focus on the discussion. They were like playing with their toys or asking if they can go outside. And it's like, I just felt bad doing this to them. I'm just like, you don't worry about any of this yet. Just go like live your life. We'll talk about this later. Get back to me in 10 years, you know? And I just wanted to give them that opportunity to be a kid. But also I just think that older kids do a really good job of narrativizing their experiences in a way that like younger kids just can't yet. Cause you're just not like self-reflective in that way. Like, I don't know what age that is that you start to become more reflective on just like who you are as a person and your thoughts and your ideas. But I think I just never realized before until I was sitting with kids that like five-year-olds and five-year-olds and eight-year-olds can't really do that yet. So it was so much of like their parents kind of helping them like along, like, you know, tell the nice journalist about this. And I didn't want the book to be that. I wanted to give the kids as much agency as possible. And I wanted to let them drive the discussion because there's so, there's all this rhetoric right now that we're like forcing kids to be trans. And it's like, you've met a teenager. You can't force them to do anything, let alone be trans, right? So, and I just want that to, wanted that to be really evident from this book that no one's forcing anything. It's like these kids speaking for themselves. And then in terms of the coming out story, I'm going to very gently push back against this a little bit because we actually don't do a lot of that in the book because like there's so much of just like coming out stories that like, like I wanted to tell stories I'd never heard before 
And I've just heard so many coming out stories that I was like, I don't know, just telling another one just didn't seem very interesting to me. So you get real little glimpses of it though. Like, I think that these kids at some level, like have always known, but just didn't have the language, right? Like they just didn't like have the words for it. So I think that their coming out journey was always just a matter of when is was this presented to you? When did you realize that this was a thing that you could be? Like every once in a while, you'll have a kid who kind of just figured it out on their own. Like Wyatt uh, was so young when like when he came out, he was like, I believe he was nine or 10, right? And he just knew that he was a boy, right? He just sort of innately knew. But I think for so many other kids, it had to be presented as a possibility, right? Like that there has to be somebody who can be a possibility model for us, not just as like trans people or queer people, but think about in your own life, right? All the things you didn't realize were possible until you saw someone who was doing it and you were like, oh, I can do that too. So I think a lot of these kids just needed that to need it, needed to know like that their lives could exist. Thank you. Jennifer Karsner, do you, would you be able to come off a of mute and, and ask your question? Sure. Uh, thanks for being here. I was wondering what you feel like was the most surprising thing you discovered as you were having all these conversations. What surprised you the most? Oh, this is such a cop-out answer and I'm really sorry, um, but nothing, because I've been doing this for such a long time that I sometimes say that I'm unshockable at this point, because like I've interviewed, like I've just interviewed about everybody, Jennifer. Like if there is a queer or trans person in this country who will talk to me, I have probably gotten them on the phone at some point. Um, it's a little bit of a joke at this point that I kind of know everybody. Um, but I will say it didn't shock me, but something I'd never heard before that I always knew was a thing, right? But it can sometimes be really hard to find somebody who not only has that kind of experience, but is in a place to share it with you, right? Because imagine you've gone like the worst thing that's ever happened to you, Jennifer, like worst day of your life, right? And then some journalist is like, hey, are you in a place to talk about it right now? You might be like, like, saw it off, go away. Like, I'm, you know, like, I'm just like feeling right now. I don't want to deal with any of this yet. So like for these kids, sometimes when they're really going through these difficult, challenging experiences, they're not in the place to tell us about it, right? And one story that we've heard very little of is trans kids who are forced to detransition. So this isn't folks like you often hear in the media about like, you know, trans people who transition and maybe they decide it's not for them for lots of different reasons. Maybe that don't have to do with like not being trans, but just that the world is hard, right? And it's hard to be a trans person sometimes in a world that doesn't want you to exist. We've heard a lot of that, but we haven't heard very much about kids who get their health care taken away. And in Florida, um, Jack, who was the girl I talked about Kierkegaard with, she went without her health care for five months because she lost it when the state revoked Medicaid coverage for gender affirming care for kids. So she, she had to watch this body that she'd fought so hard for, like just like slip away from her. And she stopped eating. Um, she didn't leave her room. And she got so skinny that her mom was worried that her heart was going to stop in her sleep. I just get teared up talking about this. Um, but it's just... For me, it was so powerful to hear that and horrible. It was like horrible to sit with her and know that she'd been through this and that there was like nothing that I can do to fix it. I'm very much like a fixer in my life. Like I'm very one of those, like if my one of my friends has a problem, I'm like, how am I going to fix it? What can I, what can I do? I'll get out the toolbox. But there was nothing here that I could fix, right? I just had to like let this young woman be in pain and to feel that pain and to sit with her in that, to sort of minister to her in that way. And that was really difficult, but it was important that we hear from her because lawmakers always treat it as if these policies don't impact real people, right? That they don't have like a real, they don't cause real harm because after all, trans kids aren't real. So how can you like, you know, hurt people who aren't real, right? And they just ignore the damage they're doing over and over again. And then we, you know, from the media don't hear those stories. So with Jack's story, I just wanted to, to make it really clear what lawmakers are doing. Like they are irreparably damning, damaging kids. That girl's going to be screwed up for the rest of her life because of what happened to her. She's in a better place now, right? So it's not all like trauma um, forever, but it's always gonna stick with her. She'll never forget what that was like. They'll always be in the back of her brain somewhere. And I just, for those politicians who are doing this, like I just wanted to like rub their noses in it to make it really clear like, you did this not only to a human being, like no human do being deserves this, but she was 17. She was a 17 year old girl and she did not deserve this. 
none of these kids deserve this. And I just think that we need to make that really clear to people who are passing these kinds of policies because they might still keep doing it, but I want to make it as hard for them to sleep at night as possible. Like, I hope they don't get a, a moment's rest. Mm, what a powerful story. Thanks for sharing that one particularly. Um, I did put in the the chat um, for, for those who wanted it right in front of them, um, Nico's book, the name of it. But Nico, I did want to um, ask, um, you know, we can find books in a lot of different places. Do you have a place where you prefer people to make a purchase of your book? Is there a, a, a platform, an avenue that you would prefer people to if they have the ability to choose? Sure. Um, so for the next month, I am obligated to say Alstora because they picked my book as their like book of the month. Um, it's an online like LGBT plus like book vendor. Um, it's A L L A or I'm just gonna put it in the chat. It's great, um, thank you. <laughs> not great at spelling. Um, so yeah, so that's Alstora. Um, go give them a couple bones. Um, it's good to support like queer booksellers. Um, and they've been very supportive of me, so I've got to throw them a little love. Yeah, great. Thank you. That's that's helpful. Um, and you can find it many places. I'll just say that as the big opening to that. We do have a couple more um, uh, questions that, that people are asking. And um, I'm just reading the handle that I see here, Mitchell's Life Force, which is fun. Uh, would you want to, to come off a of mute and ask your question? If you're able, just looking to see if they're able to. Okay, I'll, I'll ask you because it is in the general chat. So um, um, this person shares, as a small town trans person myself, I'm curious about what your interviewees named as sources of their uh, resilience. Uh, were there any factors that were named repeatedly? Not really, because like all these kids are so different from each other. And that's one of the things I loved about this book is that when we were pitching it, like publishers really wanted to like flatten the book and make it like um, who moved my cheese for trans kids is like the joke I've been using. But it's like we're like advancing this like grand unified theory of like trans kid existence. But like all these kids are so different, like the way they see the world is so different. The way they behave is so different. Their personalities are so different. Um, and I with the book, rather than trying to convince everybody that they're all the same, I wanted to let them be as different as possible. So when you read these like seven chapters, they're also radically different from each other. Like they, the kids contradict each other, right? Like one, one kid will say this, another kid says the exact opposite thing. Um, and you just really get to see their personality shine through. Um, and I felt like that's what the kids were really fighting for, right? To be their own person, to like get to lead their own life. So there was almost nothing that these kids like have in common. And I thought that that was kind of cool. Like that felt like for me, like I was doing the, my job right, letting these kids be really different. But I think that you get to see like a way that they cope in the world, right? And it's the same way that the rest of us do. Like it's not so different. Like they're, you know, they play video games, uh, you know, Jack and uh, her sibling Augie in Florida, um, that, that was sort of one of their big coping mechanisms is they would just like play video games together and watch movies. And they developed this really dark sense of humor just this very, like, very, very, like, black, sometimes, like, sick sense of humor, because it's kind of like, as I write in the book, if life is a sick joke, they might as well be in on it, right? But then in um, California, you know, Kylie has, I always have to be gentle when I talk about this, like, she comes from a place of privilege, not in a bad way, I think privilege is good, like, we, you know, like, we always want everyone to have privilege, because then if you have privilege, you don't have to deal with some of the trauma and the pain that other people do, right? Like, that's a good thing. Um, but um, with that, she like kind of enjoys being in her bubble a bit, that she feels that it's not her job to engage with advoca advocacy and activism, uh, that she just wants to be a normal teen girl, to hang out with her friends, to go to the mall, to gossip about boys, you know, to, you know, go to the beach together. And she should have that right. We should all have the right to like determine what our lives are. And I think for her, just like being a teenage girl and focusing on, the, on that rather than all these attacks on her life, you know, that feels like her self-care. It's like her own like form of protection. Um, I think in um, in Illinois, being a Muslim, a practicing Muslim is very much like self-care for Clint. It's sort of, you know, it it guides his day, you know, getting up for morning prayers, you know, doing them during lunch, doing them five times a day. Um, and it also just guides his worldview. He talks so much 
about how he doesn't really think about himself as being a trans boy because that's not like his mission isn't to be seen or his mission isn't to be seen as a trans boy. It's to be a boy. But he does very much think about being a Muslim boy. Right. And what it you know means to be like a Muslim in this world. And he doesn't always like see those things in conflict. So I think his like his Muslimness is very much like like a comfort to him. And I think it's just like these kids, it's grabbing on to like whatever they can, whatever gives them meaning, whatever like gives them solace to help them get through the, their day to day lives. And that often means just like blacking out like all these things that are happening in the world. I think we expect these kids to be like engaged and involved and like leading rallies and going to the Capitol building and doing all this stuff. But they sort of universally say that like if given the chance, they don't want to do that. Like, they just want the opportunity to enjoy themselves in their lives. Like, Wyatt in South Dakota, yeah, he, when the legislator, legislative session comes around every January there, it's from January to March, he deletes all the news apps off his phone, right? He just does not check the news for three months because he already knows. Like, it doesn't tell him anything he doesn't already know. Like, I think the thing he's trying to figure out her, for himself is how to be a kid. How to lead a lovely life and he still doesn't know like he'll text me sometimes and he'll ask me permission to go to a party or go hang out with his friends because he that didn't really get that opportunity he was just fighting for his rights so much for so much of his childhood he didn't really get to be a childhood or to get to get to have a childhood and he's still figuring out how to do that so i think for me like with this book like what i hope to do is claim the right of these kids to just have a childhood whatever that looks like, to have whatever kind of self-care coping mechanism they want, or maybe to exist in a world where they don't need self-care and a coping mechanism. They can just like be and be happy. Nico, I know you have just said in, in, in several different ways that n no kid has the exact story. It's all their own. Um, and Ophelia, I wonder if you would uh, come off mute and um, ask your question, because um, I, I do think it, um, when it comes to the question of support, um, that's one that especially those on this call would be interested in hearing. Ophelia, could you ask your question? Sorry, I thought that, okay, never mind. Um, I wasn't sure if it had already been asked in some form, but um, Nico, I'm so excited for this book. And then I also got sucked into Alstora in all um, <laughs> in all transparency. So I'm excited to get that there. Um, I wanted to know what similarities you found between kids um, about like the kinds of supports that were most important for them. You talked about um, faith communities for some, and then you know, the fact that like some kids just want to have a chance to be kids. Um, but like, were there any themes as you were interviewing more and more and more kids where you thought like, oh, okay, it seems like the kids who have X, Y, or Z, although they're not perfect, like seem to be doing more okay than other kids. Yeah, it might be surprising, but I always felt like the kids who were in states where they didn't have to worry about like existing, right? Where they can just like, you know, like be a kid and there aren't state laws limiting their lives. Those seem to be the kids that were doing the best, right? Because they just don't have to worry about all this stuff, right? They can just figure out not only what it means to be a trans teen, but just what it means to be a teenager in general. So it, they just didn't seem as burdened as everybody else. And I think it's really instructive that in Texas, we talked a little bit about Ruby, whose uh, family is Episcopalian, right? And Ruby's been loved her entire life. Like, her family gets it. They got it before she came out. So, like, when she did, they were ready. You know, she didn't have to educate them, right? And then she comes out in her church. Everybody's cool and supportive there. Um, she, when I was there, she had just gotten asked out by this guy because she's very pretty. She's, like, tall and gorgeous and can model if she wants to. The world is just this girl's oyster, like whenever she's ready. Um, but when she told him that she was trans, it was fine. Like um, she told him via text message, which I strongly encourage everyone to never do something like this. Do not tell someone via text message because it took him two minutes to respond and he left her on red, but it was because he had to call his friend and ask what was the best way to tell her that it was like totally fine and it wouldn't change anything. But this poor girl is like just sitting there like waiting like, oh my God, what's happening? Like, like, is it all over, right? Like, is this it? Um, but it ended up being fine. And she has just this lovely life, 
like this kind of like perfect existence, like as best as you could ever hope for. But even with all that, because she lives in Texas and because she lo- lives in a, a state with a transports ban, a gender affirming care ban, she, at the time that I was there, was certain that she was going to move to a different state, um, that she was going to leave behind her home and her family and the only life she'd ever known to live in a place that had affirming laws and policies on the books because she was worried that lawmakers would come after her next. That sure, she was 19 at the time and she was out of the range of the gender affirming care ban for youth. But what if they decide to raise it to 21? What if they go to 25? What if Donald Trump gets elected and then he just bans care for everybody, right? Like you can you can see where like there's just all these fears that you still operate with in the back of your head. And it's just for Ruby, it's not really a way to live. Like you can't really plan a future if you don't know whether your state is going to allow you to have that future. So I think like family support is so important, right? The friend support is so important, community support, school support, every level of support here, religious faith. But like all of that gets negated if they don't have support from their like lawmakers and politicians too. Like it has a way of undercutting all that good work that everyone's doing. So it's just for me, like it's a reminder of like how important advocacy becomes and political advocacy, because it's just like no matter what everybody else does, it still makes it harder for like these kids to exist. If the people who like are deciding whether their state will let them exist or not, like are making decisions that harm them. Like it just, you know, it kind of cancels each other out, if that makes any sense. Yes, that makes sense. And that was surprising. I would not have guessed that. But you're right. That makes complete sense. Thanks, Nico. Yeah, of course. I think that's a a great um, kind of question. And uh, one of the reasons why I kind of saved that one for because I I do, I I know that for this group um, who comes and meets together, particularly, you know, uh, one of the, the things that we are always trying to ask ourselves is, is how how can we pro- provide good support for our loved ones? Um, so I think you just you know shared many different pieces. Um, that one being a family member who who offers um, that constant support in a whole lot of different ways is really important. Um, it, but you just at the end there named that you know policies and advocacy is what you have seen is is core and central to people literally having the freedoms to get the care they need. And so I wonder if you could share with us, you know, are there practical pieces of guidance that you would give this community of how can we advocate better? Do you see avenues for for us as as people who often feel like our voice, you know, is is oh so small. Um, or do you do you have any um, kind of in, insights as to what we can do as people who do long to care and support and to provide greater affirmation in in not just our own state, but but in this um, this world that we share together. Yeah, I think there's a lot that like, you know, that congregations and religious faiths can learn from like from what I just said, because if so, let's say like state laws and policies are really important, right? It's important to these kids lives and it's important to their futures. And it's also important for kids to know that they have that affirmation or know if they don't, right? They need to know where they stand. There um, was this old study um, several years ago that showed that it's harder for kids to have a parent who waffles on being supportive, who's maybe like supportive sometimes and sometimes not, right? Then having a parent who is either not supportive um, totally or totally supportive, or well, not the totally supportive one, that's obviously better. Um, But then to have a parent like who just like totally does not affirm them, right? Um, And I think that it just shows that kids need to know where like where things stand. They need to know what the policies are, right? And there are so many like congregations that call themselves affirming but you kind of don't really know how, right? You have to really dig on their website to find out like what the policies are or to find out like, do they allow like same-sex marriages in the church, right? Like, you know, trans people like can come to the church, but how affirmed are they, right? Are they still gonna be told that their identity is a sin? Because you have so many like congregations that take sort of a like, what is it like a love the sin or hate the sin approach, right? And it's like, yeah, you can come to our church, but it's like, 
how affirmed are you really going to be? Like, they'll let you in the door, but like, what happens after then? And I think so much of the what happens after then needs to be like better explained by like, by churches, by congregations. Like in doing this work, I've been really reaching out to like, oh God, just faith groups all over the country. And I have to say, that's been kind of a struggle for me of like knowing who's safe to reach out to, because it's not always obvious. Like, sure, you can have like a flag out front or like a little rainbow banner on the site, but what does that really mean, right? And I, I think that like folks just need to get a lot more granular in terms of explaining it to people. And I think that even like, I don't know, like I think congregants would really appreciate it, right? They want to know like where their church stands. They want to know what their church is doing to support them. So I would say like, like always lead with a policy focus, right? Always lead by telling people what you're doing for them. And then also do it. Like having support groups in churches is really important because a lot of, I'm trying to figure out the best way to say this. A lot of folks live in areas where they just don't have that. So like growing up in Cincinnati, right? Cincinnati, relatively big city, right? Like mid-sized city, like 300,000 people. So you'd think, oh, a ton of stuff for queer people. When I was growing up, Pardon my French, but there wasn't shit, right? Like if you came out, there was like, as a kid, there was nothing for you to go to. And if you were looking for something, you had to go to a church. You had to go to your like UU church, your like Methodist church, your UCC church. You had to find the people who really loved the gays and were super supportive and go there to find your community or like find a place that like didn't hate you, right? And that would tell you you deserve to exist. And there just like still weren't that many churches that you could really go to. It was kind of like three if I, memory serves. And for those folks that maybe like are supportive, but don't have those like resources in place, or just don't have like, let's say like a weekly group that gets together or like a book study group or this or that, create it. Like, it's so easy, you know, like just on Thursdays, meet here. How hard is that to put it on a website, right? So do that, like figure out like, what are the resources that congregants need or even ask them, like say like, you know, like approach like somebody that you feel like would be comfortable with because you just don't want to put it on everybody like, hey, random gay person, what would you like us to do, right? You know, approach a congregant that you feel like would be open to the conversation and just ask them, what can we do to be more supportive? What can we do to be like better allies? Because like to me, like ally is a verb. People always like think of it as this noun that you're just like automatically an ally, but it's like an ally is doing the work. So just like always ask yourself like what you can do to actually do the work for like congregants. And then also those like random people who might come in like needing comfort and support. What can you do to show them that like this place is like truly supportive and truly has the resources to advocate for them? Oh, what a beautiful and wonderful um, just expression of uh, the, that you gave some action steps in, in what you just shared. I really appreciate um, you sharing in that way. And this has just been a, a joy and delight. And before, I, I know you have a busy day ahead of you and we want to support you um, on your, your journey of getting word out and being with other groups of people. But is there anything else that you'd wanna share um, as we kind of round out our time together today? Yes, I don't know how controversial this will be to say, but um, I think it's important um, that people remember um, that we have an election in less than a month. Um, and if you read this book and you care about these kids, I hope people remember um, to vote um, and to vote like it. Um, and not just in like, you know, the big election, but there are a bunch of small ones, right? There are state and local elections, there are school board elections, there's, you know, like everything that's happening in your community, right? Like I, when I wrote this book, I intentionally didn't provide a lot of closure. Um, at the end, I didn't want to tell you too much about like, everything turned out like so great for these kids, right? And they're all in such a better place. Because to me, it's like, if you want that closure for yourself, you'll provide it for these kids. Like, it's not a mystery about how the presidential candidates like stand on this issue. You know, you don't need me to tell you. One of them, I won't say who you probably guess, um, is floating a national transition ban for trans kids, right? And if like, if elected, he will definitely pursue that. And he has the tools to do it. So like, if you, if you want a future for these kids, like don't vote for them, <laughs> like start advocating for them, ask what you can be doing. Like it's up to us to like be better allies for these kids because they've been doing the work themselves for such a long time and they're tired. They're like exhausted. Like they shouldn't have to be doing this. That's one of the similarities I heard over and over again 
is that they recognize like all of these kids, they should have never been put in this position to begin with, right? They should never have had to do this level of work when they're just trying to like grow up, right? They're just trying to get to their adulthoods. So for us, like as like allies to them, I always ask people, what can you do to take that burden off of them, right? How can you get involved? How can you use your voice in your platform? Like, how can you like volunteer or donate or do whatever it is you need to do? And if like all that stuff seems complex to you and you, or you don't have the time or you're like raising eight kids and you just, you know, like you're just happy to get a moment to yourself, voting is not hard. So it is the easiest way that we can show up for these kids. So if you've got nothing else, you've got that, you've got to vote. We live in a constitutional republic. So like we all get a say in what these kids' futures look like. So just don't forget that. Sorry, my my computer's uh, frozen up a little bit. Um, thank you. That that was. I appreciate you naming that. Um, that's another action item that you have given us uh, today. So thank you for that. I do want to just mention for those on the call that I am excited that in the next two weeks we will be officially releasing a new uh, resource out of Reconciling Ministries Network. Um, it's called Transforming Church Culture: Becoming Trans Inclusive. Um, and it is a delightful resource um, that uh, highlights uh, four different trans voices, um, people who are in the United Methodist Church, um, and they are um, just sh sharing a bit of their stories. Uh, there's some theological foundations in there, um, and it's just going to be a great thing to share in your churches. We feel like it's a good not necessarily 101 uh, kind of basic course, but it, it goes a little deeper and has some um, some narrative in it that we just feel are important to, um, you know, continue to help provide avenues for conversation with one another. So I hope that you'll be looking out for that in the next couple of weeks. Again, it's called tra uh, Transforming Church Culture, Becoming Trans Inclusive. So it'll be out a good resource for Sunday school classes um, small groups, Bible studies, that sort of thing. Nico, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, blessings on your uh, journey today. You have another thing? Yeah, I actually forgot to say okay. one thing. So I'm okay, making sure to it. tell this to everybody. When uh, my, so my publisher, where they're like, you're going to do all these events and like, you know, set your expectations really low, right? Because it's like, you'll talk to these people, you'll be like, buy my book. But then they're like, uh, I think they said only 30% of like, of attendees actually do it. And I, always have very high expectations. So I just want to say, I think we can do better than that. So if you've listened to this and you've liked this discussion at all, um, please buy my book because I think we're better than 30%. I'm not going to say 100%, but I think we could get a lot closer. So thank you. And yes, it's in the, I, Ophelia just entered it again. Thank you, uh, Car, for, for sharing it earlier. Um, we hope that you will purchase uh, Nico's book so you can listen to uh, more um, about the the families, the kids that um, they interacted with um, and um, sharing their story. So again, Nico, I, I'm just so grateful for your work and for your um, you, the artistry of of crafting this experience and inviting us uh, along. Uh, what a beautiful gift um, to to the community. Um, and I just invite all of you to, to go forth. Um, remember that you, you do have a voice and you can use it in many different ways. So uh, go forth today knowing that you are, are loved and cared for, knowing that God goes with us um, each and every step along our way. We're, we're all on a journey, um, but go in God's peace and go surrounded um, in God's love, um, knowing that you walk together with others. We are not alone. Thanks so much, you guys. Take, take care and have a good rest of your day. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Nico, and congrats on release day. Thank you. Bye. My baby's my baby's being born. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye.